right, so we are getting ready to read the next few chapters of Maniac McGee. Um, and just to refresh your memory about what happens in the last three chapters, the chapters you listened to yesterday, read yesterday, um, along with the vocabulary and the comprehension, Maniac had um, left the band shell and went and found a place to stay for a while at Valley Forge, um, which had become kind of like a museum, a tourist place for people to go and see what it was like. And they had made replicas, made these reproductions of um, what the barracks would, would have been where some of the soldiers for the American Revolution had stayed and Maniac ended up staying there. And he had kind of given up. He had been very sad and um, was just ready to be done. Um, did, not, did not have any motivation to continue on. And then one night he heard some voices and the next day he went into the neighboring little building and found two little, two boys there. Um, he realized that these boys were very young and somebody was probably worried about them. And so he tricked them into going back home, which was Two Mills. They, they did admit that they lived, they were from Two Mills. And so he got them to go back home by telling them that he was a pizza delivery person. And he got them over to Cobble's Corner and he got them a pizza he, uh, from his certificate that he had won from untying Cobble's knot. So we find out that these two boys are actually John McNabb's little brothers. So John McNabb finds them, Giant John is his nickname, finds them on the street and um, gets them to come back home and gets Maniac to come with them. And if you remember, um, John McNabb was the pitcher for the Little League team who um, was unbeatable and ended up throwing um, a bunch of pitches to Maniac. I can't remember how many, where he Maniac was able to hit every single one of them. In fact, was hitting them home runs every single one. So he went and got a frog and pitched that to him. And Maniac ended up bunting that and, and was able to make it all the way around the bases and make it home, make a, in inside the park home run is what they call it, from the frog that John McNabb um, pitched him. Um, so they go home to... John McNabb and the two little boys house and we find this house and it's pretty disgusting. There are roaches everywhere. They let the dog go to the bathroom all over the house and they don't clean it up. The kitchen is a mess. Um, the dad is horrible. They are um, building some kind of structure. There's, there's, they're playing with um, the idea that the people from the West End are going to come attack them sometimes. So there's a lot of things that they're that you're going to see, continue to see, and that they've kind of alluded to or given you little glimpses of the fact that they are preparing to be able to protect themselves from what they consider the threat, which is the people from the West End, which, sorry, from the East End, which we know are not usually especially not the Beals and other people that Maniac knew from the East End are not people of violence or people that are planning to attack them in any way. Okay, so that's where we left off. So we're going to pick it up from there. All right, chapter 36. The deal was if Russell and Piper went to school for the rest of the week, Maniac would show them the shortcut to Mexico on Saturday. He figured if they all managed to survive till then, he'd come up with something. On Saturday, the boys had their paper bag packed and Maniac had a new deal. Go to school for another week and he'd treat them to another large pizza. Besides, he said, crossing his fingers, this was volcano season down in Mexico. The whole place was a sheet of red hot lava. Better wait till it cools down. They bought it. And they bought the same deal the following week. But school was still agony for the boys. It had to be worth more than pizza, more than a pizza a week. But what? 
the brothers thought and thought about it and soon began to realize that the answer was sleeping between them every night. Ever since the famous maniac McGee had showed up at their house, Russell and Piper McNabb had become famous in their own right. Other kids were always crowding around, pelting them with questions. What's he like? What's he say? What's he do? Did he really sit on Finsterwald's front steps? Is he really that fast? Kids started giving them knots, sneaker laces, yo-yo strings, toys, and saying, ask Mania Maniac to undo this, will ya? Really, little kids referred to him as Mr. Maniac. The McNabs ate it up. In the streets, the playground, school, the attention, not the pizza, was the real reason that they put up with school each day. They began to feel something they had never felt before. They began to feel important. What a wonderful thing, this importance, waiting for them the moment they awoke in the morning, pumping them up like basketballs, giving them bounce. And they hadn't even had to steal it. They loved it. The more they had, the more they wanted. And so when Maniac tried to cut the next pizza for school deal, Russell answered, no. No, echoed Maniac, who had been afraid it would come to this. No, said Russell, we want something else. Oh, said Maniac, what's that? They told him. If he wanted another week's worth of school out of them, he would have to enter Finsterwald's backyard and stay there for 10 minutes, screeched Piper, who shuddered at the very thought. When Maniac casually answered, okay, it's a deal, Piper ran shrieking from the house. On the next Saturday morning, Russell, Piper, and Maniac set out for Finsterwald's house about seven blocks away. They joined the alleys. They took the alleys, sorry. Along the way, they were joined by other kids who were waiting, their eyes at once fearful and excited. By the time they got to Finsterwald's backyard, at least 15 kids huddled against the garage door on the far side of the alley. Maniac didn't hesitate. He walked straight up to the back gate, opened it, and went in. Not only that, he went all the way to the center of the yard, turned, folded his arms, smiled, and called, Who's keeping time? Russell, his throat too dry to speak, raised his hand. For 10 minutes, 15 kids and possibly the universe held their breath. The only sounds were inside their heads. The moaning and wailing of the ghosts of all the poor slobs who had ever blundered into Finsterwald's property onto Finsterwald's property. To the utter amazement of all, when Russell finally croaked, time, Maniac McGee was still there, alive, smiling, apparently unharmed, even more amazing he didn't come out. Instead, he said, say, you guys, how about adding to the deal? If I do something else while I'm here, will you make it the next two weeks at school? Well, what you gonna do, stammered Russell. Maniac thought for a minute, then announced brightly, I'll knock on the front door. Five kids finster wallied on the spot. Several others screamed, no, don't. Piper went into some sort of fit and began kicking the garage door. Russell zoned out. Maniac took all of this to signify a deal. He hopped the backyard fence and strolled around the front. The others went back around, down the alley and around the long way. They stationed themselves not only across the street, but almost halfway up the block. And even then, they squeezed together in a bunch as though, if they allowed any space between them, Finsterwald might somehow pick them off one by one. They huddled, trembling, to bear witness to the last seconds of Maniac McGee's life. They saw him stand directly in front of the red brick three-story house, the bile green window shades. They saw him climb the three cement steps to the white door, the portal of death. They saw him raise his hand, and though they were too far away to hear, they saw him knock upon the door. And 15 hearts beat in time to that silent knocking. The door opened. Finsterwald's door opened. Not much, but enough so the witnesses could make out a thin strip of blackness. Would Maniac be sucked into that black hole like so much lint into a vacuum cleaner? Would Finsterwald's long bony hand dart out quick as a lizard's tongue and snatch poor Maniac? 
maniac appeared to be speaking to the dark crack. Was he pleading for his life? Would his last words be skewered like a marshmallow by Finsterwald's dagger-tipped cane? Apparently not. The door closed. Maniac bounded down the steps and came jogging toward them, grinning. Three kids bolted. Sure, he was a ghost. The others stayed. They invented excuses to touch him, to see if he was still himself, still warm. But they weren't positively certain until later, when they watched him devour a pack of butterscotch crimpets. Chapter 37. Thus began a series of heroic feats by Maniac. At 20 paces, he hit a telephone pole with a stone 61 times in a row. When the once a week freight train hit Elm Street, he started running from the Oriole Street dead end on one rail and beat the train to the park, no sweat. He took off his sneaks and socks and walked, nonchalantly as you please, through the rat-infested dump at the foot of Rako Hill. The mysterious hole down by the creek, the one you would never reach into, even if you dropped your most valuable possession into it, he stuck his hand in, his arm in, all the way to the elbow, kept it there for the longest 60 seconds on record and pulled it out dirty, but still full of fingers. He climbed the fence at the American bison pet pen at the zoo. He had suggested this feat himself, everyone else scoffing. And while the mother looked on, kissed the baby buffalo. So it went through February, March of that year, a feat a week. To much of the town, hearing about these things, it was simply a case of the legend adding to itself, doing what legends do. To Russell and Piper McNabb, it was a case of boosting their importance ever higher in the eyes of the other kids. Was it not at the brothers' direction that Maniac McGee performed these deeds? And who, after all, is the more amazing? The lion or the tamer? I'm recording. As for Maniac, he understood early on that he was being used for the greater glory of Piper and Russell. He also understood that without him, they would not be going to school every day. For the McNabs, there was nothing free about public education. A tuition had to be paid. Every week, Maniac paid it. And besides, he loved to meet the challenges they cooked up for him. And then one day they gave him the most perilous challenge of all. They dared him to go into the East End. Chapter 38. The witnesses, there were twice 15 this time, went with him as far as Hector Street. They halted at the curb. He crossed the street and went on alone. Piper megaphoned after him, Maniac, come back, we was just kidding, you don't have to. Maniac just waved and went on. He knew he should be feeling afraid of these East Senders, these so-called black people, but he wasn't. He was himself. He, it was himself he was afraid of, afraid of any trouble he might cause just by being there. It was the day of the worms. That first, almost warm after the rainy night day in April when you bolt from your house to find yourself in a world of worms. They were as numerous here in the East End as they had been in the West. The sidewalks, the streets, the very places where they didn't belong, forlorn, marooned on concrete and asphalt, no place to burrow, April's or orphans. Once, when he was little in Hollidaysburg, he had gone along with his toy wheelbarrow, carefully lifting them with a borrowed kitchen fork until the barrow was full and then dumped them into Mr. Snavely's compost pile. And sure as the worms followed the rain, the kids followed the worms. West End, East End, they had poured from their houses onto the cool, damp sidewalks, and if they gave the worms any notice, it was only when they squashed one underfoot. And so, as Maniac moved through the East End, he felt the presence of not one, but two populations. 
both occupying the same territory, yet each unmindful of the other, one yelping and playing and chasing and laughing, the other lost and silent and dying by the millions. Yo, fish belly. Maniac snapped too. He glanced at a street sign. He was four blocks from Hector, deep in the east. Mars bar came dip jiving towards him, taller than before, bigger, but still scowling. Hey, fish, thought she was gone. Maniac turned to face him fully. Mars bar did not stop till he was inside Maniac's phone booth of space, inches from his face. They locked eyes levelly. Maniac thinking, I must be growing too. He said, I'm back. The scowl fierce, fierce and maybe nobody told you I'm badder than ever. I'm badder every day. I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning. He leaned in closer because of how bad I might have gotten overnight. Maniac smiled, nodded. Yeah, you're bad, Mars. He gave a sniff. His smile went a little smirky. And I'm getting so bad myself, I think I must be half black. Mars's eyes bulged. He backed off. The scowl collapsed and he howled with laughter. His buddies, who were hanging back, stared dumbly. As Mars unwound from his laughing fit, he studied Maniac up and down, aware, too, that Maniac was studying him. When he could speak again, he said, Still them raggedy clothes, huh, fish? He lifted one foot, posed. I seen you looking. Like them kicks, just got them. Maniac nodded. Nice. They were more than nice. They were beautiful. The best. Yes, the baddest sneaks he had ever seen. Way better than anything Grayson could have afforded. I forgot to tell you something else too, Fish. What's that? I'm fast. I mean, I'm faster. I've been working out, got my new boss kicks. He sprinted in place, arms and legs, pistoning to a blur. He stopped, he jabbed a finger at Maniac's nose, pressed it flat in the soft end of it. See, guess you were right now. At least you got a black nose. He laughed. They both laughed. Everybody laughed. Then Mars turned scowly again, saying, you ain't black enough or bad enough to beat the Mars, man. We're going to race, honky donkey. The race was set up on Plum Street, the long level block between Ash and Jackson. By the time they were ready, half the kids in the East End were there from the tiniest pipsqueaks to high schoolers. The little kids ran races of their own from curb to curb. The bigger kids shouldered, blast, shouldered blasters and dug into their jeans for coins to bet with. For the first time since fall, mothers opened windows and leaned out from second stories. Traffic was detoured from both ends of the block. No one could find string for the finish, so a second story mother dropped down a spool of bright pink thread. Another problem was the start. First, they had to find chalk to draw the start line, and when they did, nobody could seem to draw it straight. The result, a stack of starting lines creeping up the street till somebody brought out a yardstick and did it right. The next problem came when the starter, Bump Gilliam, who was also Mars Bar's best pal, called, get ready, and someone in the crowd yelled, that ain't what you say, you say, take your mark. Well, everybody jumped into it then. There was a shoving and jawing and almost a fist fight over the proper way to start a race. Finally, there was a compromise and Bump called, get ready on your mark. At which point someone else yelled, called, go Mars. And Bump turned and snarled, shut up. When the starter starts, there's no noise. So naturally someone else called, smoke em, Mars. And then came, waste em, Mars. And do the honk bar, man. He might still be calling to this day had not a single voice separated itself from the others. Burn him, McGee. It was hands down, laughing and pointing from his perch on the roof of a car. Bump jumped into the let up. Get set, go. And at long last, mossy from their weight at the start li starting line, they went. Even as the race began, even after it began, Maniac wasn't sure how to run it. Naturally, he wanted to win, or at least do his best. All his instincts told him that, but there were other considerations. Whom he was racing against, and where, and what the consequences might be if he won. These were heavy considerations. Heavy enough to slow him down. Until, 
the hysterical crowd and the sight of Mars Bar's sneaker bottoms and the boiling of his own blood ignited his afterburners. And before you could say, burn him, McGee, he was ahead, the pink thread bobbing in his sights. But he never saw his body break the thread. He saw only the face of Mars Bar straining, gasping, unbelieving, losing. They went crazy. They went wild. They went totally bananas. You see him? He turned around. He ran backwards. He did it backwards. He beat him going backwards. Mars Bar tried. He shoved bump. You started too fast. I wasn't ready. He shoved the thread holders. You moved it up so he could win. I was gaining on him. He shoved Maniac. You bumped me. You got a false start. You cheated. But his protest drowned in the pan pandemonium. Why did I do it? Was all Maniac could think. He hadn't even realized it until he crossed the line and he regretted it instantly. Wasn't it enough just to win? Did he have to disgrace his opponent as well? Had he done it deliberately to pay back Mars Bar for all his nastiness to show him up and shut him up once and for all his only recollection recollection was a feeling of sheer joyful exuberance himself in celebration shouting amen in the bethany church bashing john McNabb's fastballs out of sight dancing the polka with grayson maybe it was that simple after all, who asks why otters toboggan down mud banks? But that didn't make it any less stupid or rotten thing to do. The hatred in Mars Bar's eyes was no longer for a white kid in the East End. It was for Jeffrey McGee, period. The crowd surged with him as he made his way westward. It wasn't clear whether they were glad or not that he had won, only that they had seen something to set, him, set them off. They jostled and jammed and high-fived and jived, and everyone who called him White Lightning, two more challenged him to a race. Right here, baby, you and me, see who's gonna turn his back on who. Maniac kept moving, embarrassed, wishing he could just break out and sprint for the West End, wishing he could duck into the Beals house and be sanctuary there and no, not fear reprisals on them. And just about then, miraculously, Two little hands were worming into his. Two familiar voices squealing, maniac, maniac, Hester and Lester. He snatched them up, one in each arm. He was on Sycamore Street. There was the house, the door opening, Amanda, Mrs. Beale, smiling to beat the band. Chapter 39. During the night, March doubled back and grabbed April by the scruff of the neck and flung it into another week or two down the road. When Maniac slipped silently from the house at dawn, the only way he'd ever managed to get away, March pounced with cold and nasty paws. But Maniac wasn't minding. The reunion had been ecstatic and tearful and nonstop happy, and inside he was pure July. He was half a block up Sycamore before he stopped tiptoeing. Minutes later, he crossed Hector. The streets were dry. An occasional scrap of chewed rawhide was all that remained of the worms. Hours later, Russell and Piper spotted him three blocks off. Maniac, you're alive. We thought they got you. We thought they slit your throat. We thought they strangled you and pulled your tongue out. We thought they chopped your head off and... and and boiled you, yeah, boiled you, and drunk your blood, yeah, and drunk your brains. You don't drink brains, you moron meatball. Yeah, you do. Brains are like milkshakes, like Dairy Queen. You can drink them with a straw. You can hear them sloshing if you shake your head hard enough. Listen, hey, get off my head. Hey, help. They were off and running. Maniac couldn't help laughing. In spite of their twisted, ludicrous impressions of the East Enders, the concern and the tears in their eyes had been genuine. They had really missed him. They had really been afraid for him. Two houses away, he could hear the thump, almost feel it. And Father George, George McNabb's voice, 
Lay him down easy, I said, easy, followed by son John. This easy enough? Thump, followed by a string of curses from George McNabb that fried the cold morning like an egg. The living room was hazy with dust. At the back of the dining room, they were bringing in the cinder blocks. George and John and a handful of cobras lugging and grunting them in from the backyard and dumping them onto the floor. Thump, thump. Hey kid, George McNabb was pointing through the haze. Three months and he still didn't know his tenant's name. Get your lily hide over here, start lugging these. Maniac waved, later, gotta go. He shut the door and headed up the street. So they were really doing it. He had heard them planning it for weeks, making drawings, buying or stealing cements, trowels, a level, a pillbox, they called it. Once it was done, they'd be ready. Let the revolts begin. Let the rebels, as they called the East Enders, come. Let them bust through the newly installed bars over the plywood on the windows. Let them bust through the steel door. They'll find themselves staring down the barrel of a little surprise. They squabbed over what the surprise should be. Uzi, AK-47, bazooka. Why, Maniac had asked Giant John one day. Why what? Why are you doing all this? To get ready, what else? Well, what do you think's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Giant John squabbed swatted a, bunch, a squad of roaches from the kitchen table and sat down. What's gonna happen is one of these days, they're gonna revolt. Who says? Who cares who says? You think they're gonna make an announcement? Maniac tried to picture Amanda and Hester and Lester and Bow Wow storming the barricades. When's all this supposed to happen? John shrugged. You never know, maybe this summer. He jumped up, grab, grabbed a beer from the fridge, flipped it open. They like to revolt in the summer, makes them itchy. They like to overrun the cities. This time we'll be ready. And he told Maniac what he often imagined lying in bed. The blacks sweeping across Hector one steaming summer night, torches, chains, blades, guns, war cries, marauding, looting, overrunning the West End, climbing in through smashed windows, doors, looking for whites, bloodthirsty for whites, like Indians in the old days, Indians on a raid. That's what they are. Giant John nodded thoughtfully. Today's Indians. The cockroach strolling up his pant leg wasn't the only thing making Maniac feel crawly. He shook off the roach. He moved to the center of the kitchen to surround himself with as much space as possible. But other people, he said, I don't hear them talking about revolts. Nobody else wants to make a pillbox. Giant John tilted the last of the beer into his mouth. Maybe when we do, he grinned. They will. That had been weeks before, and now the pillbox was underway. No longer an idea in the backyard, but a reality in the dining room. Now there was no room that Maniac could stand in the middle of and feel clean. Now there was something else in that house, and it smelled worse than garbage and turds. All right, we're going to stop there for today. We will continue reading next time.